Me. Right? All right, let's jump back into the fear of the Lord. Let me say this. I sure do appreciate your prayers. It does not go unnoticed. And uh, we, we really do appreciate it. And I don't want to um, be remiss in telling you how much we appreciate the care and the concern and the prayers and all that stuff. And we're trying to adjust to whatever this new uh, journey is. And uh, there's as many adjustments for us as I'm sure there is for some of you. But I really do appreciate it and don't know where we'd be without our church family. So uh, I appreciate that very much. All right, come back to Proverbs chapter 8. Now, if you weren't here this morning... For uh, Sunday school, you allow me just the liberty for a moment or two. I'm going to read you this passage, and then um, you'll be able to be seated there for a minute. And uh, one of the things that I want to try to get across to you is, I'm actually trying to help you. Um, you know, there's an old statement, and I couldn't find it, and I didn't Google it or whatever you do, or Siri it or whatever. But the old statement was, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, Right? And so oftentimes what happens is, is when you get that ounce of prevention from the Bible, we would rather take the pound of cure than we would to go ahead and just prevent it from happening in the first place. And one of the things that uh, I was taught years and years and years ago was by a, by a guy who was a board certified surgeon up in New York. He said one of the biggest mistakes that we make as doctors, this was him speaking of his own uh, peers and stuff. He said, we get in too big a hurry when it comes to the diagnostic process. He said, the most important thing in medicine is, is to make sure you get the proper diagnosis. He said, if you get the wrong diagnosis, you get the wrong prognosis, and you get the wrong prognosis, you get the wrong prescription, and then you can be treating somebody for a cold when they got cancer. That was his illustration, not mine. And he said, uh, so you have to spend time, and it takes time to be able to do it. He said, nowadays what they're doing, he was on up there uh, getting close to 80 at the time we had this conversation. He said, now what they're doing is, is they're pushing these doctors, and they're running people in there by the numbers, and they're trying to see how fast they can see people. And he said, what they've yet to see is the danger of how many people are being misdiagnosed because there are many symptoms that look the same, but the source is not the same. Right. And the disease is certainly not the same. So they're misdiagnosing a lot of those things. Well, oftentimes when it comes to Christianity, we think that these things happen like salvation. Listen, salvation is instantaneous. But your walk with the Lord is a lifetime. And God along the way takes you different ways and has you do different things and leads you along a pathway. And as you begin to walk on that pathway, God begins to reveal more things to you. And one of the things that we struggle with, no matter where you are, is the issue when it comes to sin. And that comes because after a period of time, we become commonplace and we get too familiar. We get too fresh in our relationship with the Lord and we lose the fear of the Lord that we should have. And then before long, we kind of let things slip and then we find ourselves on the wrong path maybe doing the wrong things. All right, he says this in chapter number 8 verse number 13 the fear of the Lord is to what? The fear of the Lord is to what? Does the Lord hate? Yeah, the Bible says in chapter 6 verse 16 these six things doth the Lord hate. So you have to learn to hate. Hate is part of it. They don't want you to have hate speech nowadays. Nonetheless, hate is in the Bible, and this is definitely hate speech. And then he goes on to say what he hates. Pride, arrogancy, evil way, a froward mouth, do I what? 1 Corinthians 15, don't turn there. He says evil communications corrupt good manners. In other words, the communication that you have with other people is not always verbal. Sometimes the communication that you have with individuals can be just something by looking at them. Sometimes, ladies, you can bat your eyes a certain way and get a man's attention. <coughs> Evil communications. Sometimes you can dress a certain way to get attention. You can say a certain thing to get attention. You can do a certain thing. So it's not just verbal communication. And sometimes you sit down behind a keyboard and that communication, what does it do? Well, if the Bible's right, and I'm, I'm just agreeing with the Bible, it says it corrupts good manners. Meaning, the individual, before he got the evil communication and got corrupted, he had good manners. Alright, let's uh, pray about that. Brother Mitch, you uh, open us in prayer, would you please? Thankful for another good day in church, Lord God. We're grateful that you uh, allow us to be here and for everything that you give us, Lord God, in your book. Thank you for this man, Lord God. I pray that you anoint him right now on his words uh, that he's prepared for us, Lord God. I pray this thing in Christ's name. Amen. Take your Bible and turn, if you will, please, to uh, uh, Proverbs chapter number 22. Proverbs chapter number 22. 
Now this thing about a, a froward mouth, I gave you the definition of froward this morning. I told you it's corrupt, it's vile, it's perverse, it's uncontrollable, it's ill-gotten, it's crooked, it's deceitful. In other words, it's everything you don't want to be. The Lord said He hates a froward mouth. I showed you this morning in this passage, if you weren't here for Sunday school, I can give you just a couple of things. Look in their Bible, if you will, Proverbs 16, first of all, and then we'll go on to 22. In Proverbs chapter number 16, and in verse number 23, he said, The heart of the wise teacheth his mouth, and addeth learning to his lips. Now, if that's the case, you know what he's trying to get across to you there? He's saying to you that, I have to understand that out of the abundance of the heart my mouth speaks, so I have to teach my mouth how to talk right. It's not naturally in me. If you don't train yourself how to think right, and it's not in your heart naturally, you have to teach your mouth how to talk right. Look at Proverbs chapter 15. Look in verse number 30. The light of the eye rejoices the what? And a good report maketh the bones fat. It has a physical influence. When people see you coming, do they see you coming in a positive way or a negative way? Do they see you always criticizing or do they see you being as willing to lift somebody up as you are to put somebody down? Listen, I told you this morning, I made it clear, I think I did at least in Sunday school, I'm not Joel Osteen. You needn't worry about me ever being a Joel Osteen. I'm going to do my absolute best to tell you what the Bible says is true and not put my own spin on it. But one of the things that happens nowadays is individuals are always looking for the positive side of things. But you want to be careful, ladies and gentlemen, about just always being negative as if you're going to balance out all the positivity in the world. You want to find a balance to those things. I have to teach my heart not just when to speak, but how to speak. And I gave you some of the things that, were that, uh, that come with having a big mouth. Take your Bible now and look in Proverbs chapter number 22. The Lord doesn't like somebody that has a, a froward mouth. You say, what? Well, it's destructive. Look in Proverbs 22, look in verse number 5. Thorns and snares are in the way of the froward. He that doeth, uh, uh, doth keep his soul shall be far from them. You know what he says? If you want to watch out, you stay away from people like that. Well, preacher, what are you saying? Well, if the fear of the Lord is to hate evil, if the fear of the Lord is to depart from evil, if the fear of the Lord is clean, then it also has to do with the company you keep. Amen. That it can include what the preacher calls the glass toilet. That can include what you watch and what you listen to on uh, your YouTube channels and all of the other stuff that's out there. It's now we're to the point you can't even keep up with all of the stuff. But you know what you have to be careful? You keep hearing that stuff all the time and hearing that stuff all the time and hearing that stuff all the time. Before long, you know what will happen? It will become a part of your vocabulary. You say, what happens? It resides in your heart. And before long, that what's in your heart will wind up coming out of your mouth. Now, if I'm going to do what the Bible tells me to do, look in 2 Chronicles chapter number 19. If I'm going to do with what the Bible tells me to do, I'm going to want to do my best to try not to sin. How about you? I don't like to sin. I don't like how it makes me feel. I don't like having a guilty conscience. I know that it's sent from God, and I know that it's a good thing for it to be sent from God, but I don't like how it makes me feel. I can't stand that pit, in the, in that, that feeling in the pit of my stomach where I know I've messed up, and I, I, I don't like that feeling, that kind of nauseated or the butterflies aren't flying in formation. I don't have to have somebody tell me, the Holy Spirit's already told me, now you know that wasn't right. I mean, sometimes, you know, we don't realize loose lips do sink ships. Well, sometimes, because we don't guard the door of our lips, we let things come out, and then before long, once it's out there, it's like feathers in a pillow on a windy day. You can't get all the feathers back. If I learn to fear the Lord the way I'm supposed to, I'll be a little slower to speak. Even a fool's considered wise when he keeps his mouth shut. That's a paraphrase, but that's what he says. He says, listen, people look at you and think you know more than you know until you open your mouth and show them there's nothing in there. Right. Look in uh, 2 Chronicles. In 2 Chronicles chapter number uh, 19. Uh, that's it. Look in verse number 6. Now this is prior to the big run up in chapter 20 when they wind up uh, being overcome by their enemies and surrounded by their enemies. And Jehoshaphat's got all the leaders and all the judges, the individuals that are there. So they're in charge of things. And he's going to give them the rules of the road and how he should, they should manage other people under their control. Can I ask you something, mom and dad? Don't you want what's best for your kids? Amen. Well, sure you do. Any good parent wants that. Husband and wife, don't you want to be pleasing to the Lord and be a good husband or be a good wife? 
I'm going to show you a secret to that. What if I were to tell you there's a shortcut to it? What if I was to tell you that there's a way that you can accomplish that without having to have all the I'm sorry's in the way if you learn before you say certain things, if you come from the right source, that you're less likely to make bad mistakes? What if I can show you that? I can show it to you from the Bible. And I can also show you from the Bible that an absence of what I'm going to show you, I'll guarantee you an absence of it is going to lead to heartache and pain. Uh, 2 Chronicles chapter number 19, verse number 5, He set judges in the land throughout the fenced cities of the city of Judah, of Judah, city by city. And He said to the judges, Take heed what you do. Pay attention to what you do. For you judge not for man, but for the Lord, who is with you in the judgment. Wherefore now let the fear of the Lord be upon you. Take heed and do it, for there is no iniquity with the Lord our God, nor respect of persons, nor taking of gifts. You know what he just said there? Jehoshaphat sitting there before they're getting ready to go. And he said, boys, when y'all get ready to judge, you make sure that when you judge, you judge in light of what God says. And you let the fear of the Lord rule the decisions you make. And you won't have to worry about backing up and saying, well, I made the wrong decision or I took a bribe or I did something that made, uh, made things better for me or feathered my nest. I did that because I feared the Lord. I did what was right to do. I told you about the three Hebrew children last week. Whether or not God will deliver us or not, He's still God. But if not, the Bible teaches you. Uh, Daniel, I mean, uh, not Daniel, Nehemiah said everybody else did this and it was an accepted norm and nobody else had a problem with it. But because I feared the Lord, I didn't do it. See, you're called to a different standard. You ever look at Joseph over there? Joseph gets taken up. They sung about it this morning. They did a great job with that song. They sung about it today. And what they said during that song was, is that God meant it for good. Well, that's true. But imagine this. You have a woman over there in the book of Genesis. And she's coming up there to Joseph, the house boy, and telling him that uh, she has... Uh, uh, um, D designs with him and things that she's wanting to do that he knows better than to do. You know what Daniel says? I mean, uh, Joseph says in that passage, how can I do that and sin against God? Not just sin against my boss, not just sin against the household, not just sin against you. He said, how can I do that and sin against my God? You say, what is that? That's the fear of the Lord. I'd rather take a false accusation and be pleasing to God than to go ahead and go along with it and hope I don't wind up getting caught. Now, you know what winds up happening? Potiphar comes home and he gets mad as a wet hen and throws Joseph in prison. And if you stop the story right there, it almost looks like it's unequitable. It looks like it's not fair. If you look at it at that point, let me ask you something. Have you ever read the Bible and come up to the crucifixion and stop at the crucifixion? And then realize you just read something that's the most unfair thing that has ever happened? And the Lord, when was reviled, He reviled not again. He opened not up His mouth. As a sheep before her shearers is dumb. Do you ever realize how that is? That's your Creator. That's the Word was with God, the Word was God, as uh, Brother Dan mentioned the other day. In John chapter number 1, all God and all man, and He's God, and He died for you, and He's up there taking it, and let Him nail Him to a cross, and lays His life down for you, and is yet to be rectified, and it's been 2,000 years. Tell me what He did when He spoke for Himself in defense of Himself. You say, what was He doing? He was more in line with what the Father wanted Him to do for your benefit than He was about His reputation. Sometimes this little thing we have connected with our flesh called a reputation can get us in a whole heap of trouble. We just have to be uh, vindicated. We have to be, uh, have somebody come in and justify our behaviors and things like that. When the Lord says, why don't you just be quiet and let me take care of it. Amen. That requires faith though, doesn't it? I mean, if that's the case, don't you have to be willing to live by what the Bible says instead of how you feel? Doesn't seem just all the time though, does it? Doesn't seem right. You ever been working at a place somewhere and the person that happens to be the busybody at the place and happens to always be in the boss's office and doing all the other kind of thing because they're jovial, they can't do their job, but they talk their way through it. I mean, by the time they get through talking, they've been so busy talking, they could have done the job ten times over. All they do is just talk their way through it and they wind up with the promotion and you don't. And you're working your fingers to the bone. Doesn't seem just, does it? The first thing you want to do is go throw your resume on the desk or pound on the desk and say, hey, I don't understand why this is going on. And the Lord said, why don't you just let me take care of it? Maybe that promotion will get you in trouble. 
Maybe that promotion will keep you from going to church. Maybe that promotion will make you wind up cheating on your wife or cheating on your husband. Maybe that promotion will cause you to get so money conscious that you forget what things are important. See, you don't know what God's doing. It requires faith to do that. What I have to do is, is the Lord keeps it simple. Now, this is just for me personally. He makes it simple. He goes by the kiss theory of me. It's called keep it simple, stupid, or keep it stupid, simple, however you want to say that. But what he does is, is he said, do you want to cease from sin? I said, I do. He said, okay, fear me. So you shouldn't be afraid of him. The Bible says perfect love casts out fear. That has to do with the perfect love he had when he died for me on the cross. I'm already in that. I'm not afraid of going to hell anymore. I'm saved. I'm not worried about that at all. That's where that passage fits. It hadn't fit for you right now. If you think perfect love casts out fear and I'm not supposed to be afraid of God, you know what you're going to do? You're going to struggle with sin all your life. You know what your relationship with God's going to be? It's just going to be with Him as a sin forgiver. That's it. All you're going to do is, is constantly say, James 4, just constantly say, Lord, forgive me, Lord, forgive me, Lord, forgive me. Lord, don't punish me too hard. Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. Lord, I know I've done wrong again. I know I shouldn't have done it. The Lord said, do you ever wonder why you do wrong? Do you ever ponder that? Does it ever make you think? I do. I wonder sometimes when people talk about eternal security. Do you ever wonder if you really boil it down? You preachers have dealt with them before. You deal with somebody about eternal security. Every single one of them down to the person, they're looking at their own personal life and they can't believe that if I'm saved, I would do what I've done. Think what I've thought, said what I've said. Every one of them is looking at their physical work. They're not believing the Bible. What they're doing is, is they're saying to themselves, well, I must have done this and that. If I've done that, I must be lost. No, you're not lost. You're out of fellowship with the Lord. Every one of them that doubts that, that's what they do. Well, you know what winds up happening? Instead of us pondering and thinking about it a minute, we become professional sin confessors. We're better than any Catholic you've ever met. The only difference is, as you know, to confess to the priest, the mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who's seated up there in heavenly places, ever lived to make intercession for you. And you know how to come down here and get cleaned up in the blood of Jesus Christ and thank God for it. But you never pause to wonder, why am I down here again? Confessing the same thing again. Why did I do that again? Can I tell you? The answer's clear. You didn't fear the Lord. You did not fear the Lord and depart from evil and hate evil. What is evil? Anything that doesn't line up with him. You know what's strange about the passage in Proverbs chapter number 6? When the Lord said six things, the Lord had yea seven are abomination to him. Can you find smoking cigarettes in there? Mini skirts? Haircuts? Can you find rock and roll music in there or going to rock shows? Can you find tattoos in there? Come on. Can you find all the stuff that preachers preach on to make you think that you're good and holy? That's not a single one of those things that the Lord said are an abomination to me. You know, one of the things that stands out in there, think about this now. You say, it's got to be smoking uh, uh, cigarettes or smoking dope or something, sm passing the tater around, or, or, or maybe it uh, has to do with liquor or something like that. It's got to be that preacher. I mean, that's all the other preachers preach on. got to be a foul mouth preacher. got to be adultery and fornication and those kind of things. That's not in there. You know what he says in 2 Corinthians chapter number 7? Let us cleanse ourselves of the flesh and the spirit. You know the rest of the verse? In the fear of the Lord. God's looking on the inside. I'm pretty sure you're being kind of stout. You're kind of, being, kind of being kind of stern. I'm trying to give you an answer to your sin problem. I don't care about the doctor's bedside manner. If he knows what my problem is and said there's a chance to get me well, come in here, lay it on me, man, and tell me how much it's going to cost me to pay you for the years of education you've got and having an office building that I can come into and give me some medicine. I got a cotton-picking headache. Well, I know you probably have a headache, and I'll speak softly so as not to hurt your ears. And I don't want to, let me turn, let me tell you. No, I got a headache, Doc. What are you going to do about it? You got a headache because you hit yourself in the head with a hammer, stupid. And now you got a big old knot on your head, and here's you some medicine. You can take it and take two aspirin and call me in the morning. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. Gives me the peace to knowing that I'm doing something a doctor told me to do. Am I making any sense to you at all? Y'all yes. hadn't fallen asleep on me yet. You ladies had a bunch of sugar. Us other guys didn't get that. But, so you men, you don't have any excuse. <laughs> do you ever pause? Do you ever ponder? Do you ever wonder, why do I keep sinning? Yes, sir. You don't hate evil. You don't hate wicked things. The Lord said, I will set no wicked thing. David said, I will set no wicked thing before my eyes. 
Well, if it's wicked and it's evil, what should we do? We shouldn't be looking at it. Amen. Am I right? Amen. Preacher, that just sounds a little too straight. See? See, here comes the justification. That's what we do as if God's sitting down going, hey, what do y'all think about that? This sound good to y'all? Can I get a thumbs up from you? How about a smiley face? One of those imagey things or whatever it is. Right? Send a, send a, a picture, little exploding hearts or whatever. Oh, I just, I just love that. And that's the Lord is going, what do y'all think? Does this sound good to you? Do you really think that's how he's laying this out? Joseph goes over there, you know what he says? He said, my parents may not know anything about it. My brothers may not know anything about it. The people in the land I came from, I'm probably the only oddball around here that comes from a nation that nobody likes. My skin color is different. My ways are different. My religious upbringing is different. My upbringing is entirely different. I'm a slave in a whole other country, and I will not sin against God. You want to teach your kids something worth taking home with them? You teach them to be afraid of God when you're not there. You say what? That'll keep them out of a lot of trouble. I mean, do the best you can to correct them when they're around. But you know what they have to learn eventually? They have to learn their sin is against God. They can sin against you. They won't get saved because they sinned against you. When they wake up and realize my sin is against a holy God, all of a sudden it's a come to Jesus meeting. You say, well, why do I continue to struggle, preacher? And why do I doubt my salvation? The bottom line is you don't fear the Lord. You don't hate evil. Nowadays, that almost sounds like hate speech because it's so contrary to the world. Do you realize they're teaching a group of kids right now, they're teaching a group of kids to embrace things that are ugly as if they're pretty? They're teaching, they got all these weird looking cartoon things and all that. The guy sitting next to me, I hadn't traveled in a while, but he's sitting next to me on a plane, he's playing this game, and they got these things with, I mean, things that we used to call, in my day, they were mentally deficient and they were, they were horrible to look at. I mean, used to be you had the humpback of Notre Dame and Frankenstein. Those were called monsters. And nowadays, you're supposed to have beauty and the beast. They're teaching you to embrace things. And guess what comes along? All these trannies teaching kids and reading stories. That's the most god-awful, ugliest thing you've ever seen in your life. They're teaching them to embrace abnormal things. So when the little green guys come down from outer space or from out of the center of the earth or out of the Bermuda Triangle or wherever in blazes they come from, when they show up, our, your kids are going to be like, Oh, hey, guess what? Aren't they pretty? No, they are behind ugly. <laughs> that was a good catch. <laughs> no, they're ugly. They're nasty. They're not fun to look at. They have all kind of disfigurements. Those aren't good things, but they're teaching your kids to embrace that. And God forbid, don't say anything about it. No, you're a pervert. You say, why? You're a girl and call yourself a guy. I don't care if you try to dress like a guy. I don't care if you try to talk like a guy. I don't care if you carry a hammer like a guy. I don't care if you can hammer better than a guy. You are not a guy. But they're teaching you to embrace that as if there's some embracement of something that's absolutely wrong. Do you realize the psychological effect of that? That eventually what happens is the line between right and wrong is so clearly blurred that everybody now gets offended. Even in church when I say, that's just wrong. You're like, well, I, you know, I don't, I don't know. I mean, it's just kind of how you see it. And, you know, I, I mean, I wasn't taught that way. You were taught wrong. Well, no, we weren't taught wrong. We were just taught different. No, you were taught wrong. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, the Bible is very clear. Whether you accept it as the authority or not, the Bible's very clear there's one way to heaven. Yes. That's it. And the Bible's very clear on right, and the Bible's clear on wrong. It's not a gray. Amen. It's black and white. And if you're, you're, you're very poorly informed and ignorant if you don't recognize that the devil uses you against yourself and he boosts your intellect and how you feel about your reputation because every religion invokes self-righteousness except the one that teaches the Bible we get in by his righteousness. Our relationship with Jesus Christ boils down to one thing, we're no good. Amen. We can't get there on our own. Every other relationship, every other religion has an element of works in there. Yes, sir. 
that I, I can prove it and I can do it and I can be it and I'm better than you and I'm trying to prove something. I'm not trying to prove anything. I've already had it proven to me. I'm no good. I'm saved and I'm still no good. I battle it every single day. Every day. Only time I don't is when I'm asleep. I'll be jumped, I'll go to sleep and then I'll wake up. When I wake up, you know what I find out? He's right here with me. Come to Proverbs chapter 25. Can I ask you this? Are you, are you forward when it comes to what the Lord has to say about things like that? Are you rebellious toward it? Do you buck it? Or do you embrace it and go, Lord, appreciate the diagnostics. Don't really like the bedside manner, but I sure appreciate it. You say, what? He's just trying to help you. I, I've seen a few quacks in the day and time in my life, but you know what? I've got to be honest with you. I never really saw somebody that wasn't trying to help. I, I never went to see somebody that wasn't making an attempt to use their medical degree in an effort to try to help me. Maybe they, maybe they got it wrong, but at least they were trying to do right. Can the Lord say the same thing about you? I'm not talking about the people that aren't here tonight. I'm talking about you. I'm not talking about their struggle with sin. I'm talking about your struggle with sin. Have you ever paused to ponder? Could I, could I just be, could I just ask you to do, ask yourself this question. Do I hate evil? Do I hate evil enough to depart from it? Do I realize that when I'm in a bad situation, a bad set of circumstances, if I hate evil, I don't have to say anything. I don't have to grandstand. I don't have to be a jerk. You know what he said? Get up, get out. Amen. Amen. I've been to a party before. I know you find that hard to believe. You can't believe anybody would ask me and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, I've been to a couple parties before. And I show up at the party and I hear the seal break on a bottle. And I hear the <laughs> getting poured out. And I hear, Tsh, and it ain't Coca-Cola. And you say, what do you do? I stand up on a soapbox and I start preaching. And I'm making all mad at me and all that other kind of stuff. You say, what do you do? I say, come on, baby, let's go. We ain't got no business being here. I don't have to grandstand. Where'd you go? I had to leave. Why? I don't need to be around that. Oh, so you're goody two-shoes. No, I'm afraid of it. You ever tried it? No, thank you. You say, why? I'm scared of it. You say, why? I'm afraid I might like it. I'm being honest with you. Do you know how hard that is sometimes? Don't tell me you don't like to be liked. I can tell you like to be liked. That's why you spend so, time, so much time courting everybody, trying to get them on your side about whatever else it might be. That's why you can't stop the, the bucket mouth. Amen, amen, good preaching. I know that that's you. You're insecure. You know how much you want to be liked? It's kind of like, well, I could walk around with some ginger ale. You could walk around with... Uh, 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 some orange juice, they'll think it's a, a mixed thing or whatever. I can walk around and put a little umbrella and a cherry in the top of the thing and at least I won't be such an oddball. Do you hate evil? Do you hate evil enough to depart from it? Come on, preacher. You don't have to be a jerk. Do you hate evil enough to depart from the wrong religious crowd? Come on. I'm going to offend some of you now. I'm just going to tell you up front, but at least I'm going to be honest with you. The Lord is harder on individuals that are in a religious crowd and He makes fun of them and puts them down for being affiliated and associated with the wrong kind of things and says that they make people a twofold child of hell and says to them they have a place reserved to them in the lowest hell because they're messing around with the souls of mankind. That kind of evil. Do you hate evil bad enough to say, I don't want to be a part of that? Not and condemn people and burn in hell. Do you hate it bad enough to speak out against it? Well, preacher, that's just unpopular. Well, maybe that's why the Lord didn't call you to preach. I can't be affiliated with that. Preacher, they're going to have a big interfaith council downtown. They, we don't even get the invitations anymore. I guess after a while they got the message. They invite us and invite us and invite us, believe it or not. I knew a few people down there years ago. They don't even bother to invite. Don't invite him. He ain't coming. And if he does, he's going to say something we don't agree with. You think I'm going to sit with a bunch of tongue-speaking charismatics up on a platform and act like we're going to sing Kumbaya and roast marshmallows up there on the stinking platform just for the sake of making the city look like some kind of something it ain't? You just well stamp Sodom and Gomorrah right out there where you come in the north end of town where it says you're now entering into Duval County. You just well name it Sodom and Gomorrah. 
and I'm going to sit up there with them and claim that we're going to call on God to fix things? My foot. I can't even agree with the religious leaders. So what do you do? We got to do our own thing. You say, why? I hate evil. I hate individuals that create or cause a system that make people die and go to hell and they're so selfish they don't care who they condemn to go to hell. They're more interested in being right themselves. I despise that. You say what? The Lord spoke out against that. Now you do whatever you want to do. There's not a multiplicity of ways to get there. Oh, we're all headed to the same place. Yeah, you're going to get there if you don't change too. I'm not going where some of you are going. I'm not going to hell. I'm going to heaven. You say, why? I took the highway out. You can't be definitive about that. No, you can't be definitive about that. You just soon send somebody to hell is what you just soon do. How do you think the Lord would speak about that? Nine times in the New Testament, more than any other preacher that's in that Bible, the Lord Himself addresses hell. Nine times. I bet your religion don't talk about hell. You say, why? Because you love yourself. That's just the fact of the matter. You don't hate evil. What's the worst kind of evil? A guy runs around with a grapefruit on his head and wearing a dress and claiming to be a vicar of Christ? You say, what's he doing? He's kicking people into hell right and left, right now. And you know what? It don't bother you at all. Hell's not real to you. You don't even believe it's going to happen. Well, you're going to find out when you get there. I think the reason some people wind up going there and the reason that they're trying to air condition it is because they're planning on moving in. But you see, nowadays you live in a time where that's considered hate speech. You ever read what the Lord said about it? Mr. Babylon, the great whore? You ever read what he said about it? Or do you bother to read the Bible? You know God's holy word? A lamp to your feet and a light to your path? Can I say this to you in a, trying to be in a convincing kind of a way here? Can I say this to you, ladies and gentlemen? Now you're breathing God's air right now. I'm glad he's not insecure. You say, what? He could suck the breath right out of your lungs right now if he wanted to. The very fact he lets you live in rebellion says what a great God he is. He sits up there and he says, make fun of me and laugh and mock and belittle and do whatever you want to do. Your life comes to an end eventually. You're going to answer to me one day. So go ahead and do what you want to do. No problem. And then when you get there, you're going to try to blame him. You ain't going to blame him. God orchestrated events in your life to give you an opportunity to hear a clear presentation of the gospel. And if you reject it, when you get up there and find yourself down in hell, you're going to say, it's my fault I'm here. He gave me the way out. I was too proud to take it. Right. The whole time claiming to be humble. Amen. Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. It's been 493,000 days since my last confession. <laughs> I've been on the straight and narrow and doing really good and Hail Mary full of grapes and all. Preacher, you shouldn't say that. You don't care about the hundreds of thousands and millions of people going to hell. I'm not even talking about Islam. I'm talking about a Roman religion. You say, what is that? Do you hate the evil? I didn't say the person. Do you ever wonder why there's all the religions in the world? That's the devil's way to do whatever he has to do to try to get somebody to hell. So he creates diversionary tactics. And he designs a religion for every stripe of everything that there is. We better move along before I completely alienate you. Proverbs chapter number, did I give you the one in 22 yet? Where are we at? I'm in 25. Oh, I am? How did I get to 25. 25.14, that's it. Thank you. Whoso boasteth himself of a false gift is like clouds. That's not it. No, it goes along with the passage in Ecclesiastes chapter number 12. You have to give me a minute. That's a scribal error there that I've lost. I'll have to find the other one. Come to Psalm 34. Psalm 34. I don't know what that one is. Let me ask you a question. If the Lord has uh, seen fit, yes, yeah, Psalm 34, if the Lord has seen fit to give you truth, can He trust you with truth? Are you careful how you handle it? Are you too quick to pull out the sword when you ought to be using a towel? Are you in a big hurry to cut off somebody's ear? To amputate a limb? To kill somebody? 
You know what I wouldn't do, ladies and gentlemen? I wouldn't be any more gracious with an individual you're dealing with than God's been gracious with you. I mean, how you got the light and all that other kind of stuff, honestly, God only knows. I mean, I don't know why I wasn't raised in a foreign country and with a towel on my head and a rug under my knee and uh, three times a day leaning toward Mecca and bowing down. If I was, I don't know if I'd be able to be saved. That'd be hard to overcome. I'm grateful I wasn't raised in the Catholic Church. I'm grateful that I wasn't taught that if I went to any other church but the Catholic Church that I was anathema. But I've seen people cling to that. You know what? They, they're thirsty for it. They're, they know they need something. They're deceived. They can't help it. They're ignorant to it. Why is it that all of a sudden you woke up one day? I was seven years of old my, uh, age and my daddy preached a stinking fire out of hell itself. And I was scared to death I was going to burn. Well, that ain't no reason to get saved. Well, you use whatever reason you want. It was for me. I know when I got saved. I can't give you a date. I know it was a Sunday afternoon after church. I know that that thing was just as real to me today as it was 60-something years ago now. 65, 60, whatever, 63, 2, 62 years ago, whatever. Something like that. I, it's just as clear to me now as it was then. Amen. That means God took time to deal with a 7-year-old boy. Amen. And nobody in here, if the Bible's right in Romans 1, is going to stand up there before their Creator and be able to say, well, you never told me. You're not going to do it. He said, if there's nobody to tell you, even nature itself bears witness to you. So you won't have an excuse. So that they are without excuse. Well, it won't happen. You're going to get up there and you say, well, Lord, the reason I didn't, well, the hypocrites in the church. That's a cheap excuse when you get up there. Half the hypocrites in the church are going to be in heaven. I'm one of them. Preacher, that's a hypocrite up there. Preacher, you're a hypocrite. You're right. I'm in heaven. Where are you headed? So you're too sophisticated to believe old country boy religion. Well, I'd rather be a country boy and be saved than be sophisticated and smart and be lost. Psalm chapter 34, give you a couple of things here that we'll run over real quick. I, I, uh, the fear of the Lord provides me protection, keeps me from getting into trouble. The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him and delivereth them. Now I told you, but if not, but the Lord still delivers you. I've given you illustrations of individuals that have died even though they've been diagnosed and they're saved and so on and so forth. And the Lord's the idea of deliverance is Paul gets his head cut off. John the Baptist gets his head cut off. You know what John the Baptist says just a chapter before uh, he winds up dying over there because he's been preaching against Herod and his uh, uh, brother's wife? You know what John the Baptist says? Did you ever look at that? He says, is it really you or do we look for another? Because this thing ain't working out like I think it ought to be working out. I mean, if it's really you, I did what you said. I heralded your coming, and I've been preaching, and I've been baptizing people, and I come in here, and I rebuke the sin that's present in front of the palace of everybody. Can I just ask you a question? Is it really you, or do we look for another? I'm not even sure anymore. The next thing you know, the axeman is sharpening up the sword and John says, hey, what are you doing there? He said, I'm fixing to take your head off. And he said, okay, man, sharpen it up some more. Make sure it's a clean cut. I mean, you look all through the Bible. You know what you find? You find the people that did what God told them to do. Oftentimes, they paid for their life. God gave them a graduation ceremony. Man, what a way to go. I mean, think about that. To go down as a martyr. Dying for something worth dying for. I had the benefit of working next to uh, some of the greatest men and women I've ever known in my entire life. I wasn't in the military. I was a policeman. And I had the benefit of individuals that on a daily basis were willing to go lay their life down for even people they didn't even know. You don't think that's something to be shoulder to shoulder with somebody like that and to watch them and to watch the respect that gets paid when those individuals pass off the scene in an untimely death and that flag draped coffin and taps blowing and the flyover going on and the 21 gun salute and all that. That stuff still gives me chills and I've been out of it for years now. Imagine what it would be like to go down as that kind of a Christian. To say I didn't compromise my faith and it cost me my life. Boy, don't you know there'd be a crown waiting on you when you get to glory. Thank <laughs> you. 
Paul said, I'm now ready to be offered. Henceforth there's laid for me a crown of righteousness and for all those that love is appearing. Paul said, I don't care how I get out of here, man. I just soon get out of here. Why, the one you're following died a martyr's death. Your Savior laid his life down for you. He died for what he believed in. Isn't that true? What a great way to go. You know what amazes me, ladies and gentlemen, is I've seen back in the days of Vietnam and stuff like that, I've seen communists back under Ho Chi Minh and stuff like that, and then back before that under Chinese uh, regimes, I've seen them willing to give up everything they have, including their life. I'm amazed, I'm enamored by individuals that will strap on a bomb and go blow themselves up. And we all look at that as fanaticism, but I know a lot of military guys that went over there and became a bullet stop because they believed in fighting for their country. They just go about it a different way. And then I see Christians worried more about their reputation than they are about dying for the right cause. Amen. Amen. You're worried about a reputation. Not going to cost you your life. Man, what a way to go. Those people outdo us 10 to 1. Communist comes in and says it all belongs to you all. Take it. We all share and spread it out uh, the way we want to. We know that's wrong. I understand that. I'm a capitalist. I get all of that kind of stuff. But look at their level of commitment. To a cause. They love that cause so much that they're willing for it to supersede even their own life. Well, isn't that Christianity just kind of made over a different way? Doesn't that Lord say, love not your life unto the end? Doesn't the Lord try to explain to you on a regular basis in there that you have to die daily? Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Isn't that what he teaches you? You're supposed to be a living dead person. You know what the Bible says? That Bible said, if I fear him, you know what he says? He said, guess what? The Lord will take care of you and he'll deliver you. It may be in a fiery furnace. It won't burn you long. You go and get an opportunity to do it. I give this uh, just a couple more minutes here. You go read Martyr's Mirror. I try to read it at least once a year. I can't make it through the whole thing anymore. A little tiny writing in that thing and my eyes aren't where they used to be. But I read through that stuff to remind me of the forefathers and what they went through when they didn't have a pot to pee in or a window to throw it out of. And they were so poor, they were so broke they couldn't pay attention. And they're up there willing to give their life just to be able to say, I don't believe baptism saves you. I believe I got saved by trusting Jesus Christ. And down they go and they get drowned or they get the head put in a sack full of snakes or they get put in there and eaten up by rats or buried up to their chin and honey poured all over them and let ants eat them up all because of what they believed. I mean, I'm talking people that were fully committed. You say, what happened? They didn't leave. Their bones are still out there, preacher. Yeah, but they got delivered. The Lord said the world's not worthy of them, Hebrews 11. You say, where are they now? You're circled about, you're camped about with so great a cloud of witnesses. That's your forefathers. They were willing to die for what they believe in. Why, if I say that stuff nowadays, you know what you folks think? You think, man, you must be crazy. You must be nuts. You think you're willing to die for that? Well, your forefathers were. How do you think you got that King James Bible in your lap? You don't think that blood was spilled in order to provide that for you? Let's go all the way back to Calvary. You wouldn't have it if blood wasn't spilled. You got a bloody religion. You ask any other religion, and I take this from the old preacher, you ask any other religion, what did your prophet do for you? Mine died for me, shed his own blood for me, took my place for me, propitiation for my sin. That's what my Savior did for me. What would yours do? He's leading you out of a songbook up here. You say, preacher, this is just old hat. This is stuff you need to be reminded of. There's about five or six hundred uh, 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 songs in there about my Savior. Where's the songs about yours? I don't care who it is. The Catholic Church don't have that. They don't sing about the Pope. They don't sing about Rome. They sing the things that are in that uh, hymn book that you have. Well, where's, where's it, if, it, if what I'm telling you is not right? You know what happened? Sometimes the Lord delivers you from a bad situation by the best thing he could ever do. I told you when my dad passed, a fellow called me up. He's very kind and said, you know, hey, what happened? I said, man, it was a great miracle. My dad's doing better than he's ever done. You are kidding me. I said, yeah, complete recovery, man. It's the most remarkable thing we've ever seen. He, he said, man, that's a miracle. I said, it is a miracle of the new birth. He goes, oh, well, yeah. <laughs> oh, well, yeah. You know where an old uh, hard-headed policeman got comfort when his old man passed off the scene? I knew in whom his old man believed and was persuaded that he was able to keep him against the day he died. I never had a doubt about it. 
We took him out there in the cemetery and planted him before the service because he didn't want a bunch of people gawking at him. And I stood there with a great affirmation knowing, I'll see you again. I know where you're at. That's the greatest gift that old man ever gave me. Knowing where he was when he passed on. You know, my mom is getting close now and that kind of thing. I hope she lasts forever, but it ain't going to last forever. Nobody lasts forever. She's up 93 now. I know what happens if they go in one day and she's at the house and she's laying there and ain't getting back up. I'll shed tears. I'll weep and cry. I'll be sad because she's been good. But I'll know this. Years ago, you know what she told me? She had trusted Jesus Christ as her personal Savior. And when that day comes, no preacher is going to have to try to preach her into heaven. Amen. She's already there. You say, does that stuff matter to you? Yeah, she's already guaranteed deliverance. I don't have to fear death. I might fear the way I go, but <laughs> I don't have to fear death. I know where I'm going. You say, well, that's just bravery. No, it's not bravery. It's just knowing some things. Anybody that tells you you're brave, they're either insane or they're lying. I don't care how many of those scrapes you've been in. You still have an element of fear there. You may learn how to overcome that or compartmentalize it, but you still got that stuff that's in you and you're just able to kind of push that thing down. But buddy, when your day comes, I've been there when the biggest and strongest and the baddest are sitting there crying like little girls and knowing they're fixing to step off into eternity and they never made that decision. But boy, they were big and tough here. Right. You better do it quick, bud. You're fixing to go. Go ahead and grit your teeth like the man on the second row. I don't need none of this kind of stuff. I'm good to go. I'm fine. All right? You won't see me in hell. Brave and bold, are you? That fellow drove home that night and had been a policeman for about 30 years and had seen about everything you could possibly see and ran off in a fog bank and ran, rode down into that thing and hit that uh, little embankment there, that culvert that was there, drove that steering wheel up through his chest and that kind of a thing. You know what he did when he walked out of that room right there? He said, yeah, well, that's not really much. I don't really need all that stuff. Okay, Pop. Free will. Assuming he's going to be here tomorrow. Well, he ain't. Look down in the next verse right there, if you would. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blesses the man that trusted in him. Verse number 9. O oh, fear the Lord, ye his saints. There is no want in them that fear him. Can I say I don't only get protection from him, I get provision from him? Amen. He gives me what I need. Amen. Never seen the righteous forsaken nor received begging bread. May not be what I want, but I got plenty of what I need. So, oh, but preacher, that's what he promises you. If I don't have it, I must not need it. But let me give you one more, and this is a, a, a perverted way to look at things here. Look, if you will, down in verse number 14. The Bible says this, Depart from evil and what? Do good. And do good. Seek peace and pursue it. Let me ask you a question. Uh, if all you're wanting to do is, is to, to try to embrace evil and keep doing the bad things that you want to do and then trying to justify it or abate your conscience by adding a little religion or giving something to some poor people or uh, making a donation somewhere or whatever, or helping out somebody in certain times of the year, give to the cancer fund and all that. I didn't say that thing's bad. Uh, give to the little children at the burn wards and those kind of things. A lot of that's done just to abate your conscience. It's done because God's bothering you. You know what he said? Depart from evil. Well, this idea of just confessing your sins all the time, ladies and gentlemen, it locks you into a mindset that all there is in a relationship is you messing up and God correcting you and you messing up and God correcting you and you asking God to forgive you and God correcting you and you asking God to forgive you. You know what you're doing? You're planning right now to sin when you leave. You're planning right now a way that you can do it and then ask God not to be too hard on you. You want victory over sin? You say, preacher, I want victory over sin. Take your Bible and come to Philippians chapter number 2. I want victory over sin. Make it First Peter first. You got just a couple more minutes? Is just the fan running in here or is it hot? I thought it was hot. I thought it was just y'all making me nervous. First Peter. The person who just wants forgiveness from sin and has no desire to stop it 
Uh, let me just tell you, there's no answer for a person like that. You can put them in the penitentiary from now on. You hearing me? Send them to the P farm. You can send them to a, quote, correctional institute. That stuff doesn't correct anybody. Those things used to be called penal institutions. You were penalized for doing that stuff. Penitentiary, penance. It wasn't a correction facility. You went there, you did wrong. You went there to pay for the wrong you did. But they've changed that now. They've sophisticated it now. They've made a euphemism out of it. That doesn't sound very nice. And what we need to do is, is say, what you need to do is, is recognize if you do wrong, there is a penalty, a penalty to pay for it. Amen. We're not here to make sure that you don't uh, uh, have a recidivism rate that's somewhere above 80%. We're not here to try to reinstitute you and try to retrain you and make you. You're here to pay for what you did wrong. Instead, they got every kind of educational program in the world. Well, let me ask you something. If you study that at all, go pull the FBI statistics when you get home tonight. That'll give you something to Google instead of watching the mess on the box. Go home and Google that. You know what you'll find out? Even with all the programs, your recidivism rate is through the roof right now. And not a single correctional facility has the answer to the continual problem they're having. They're building more prisons. There's so much money in it. It's so lucrative now that they've got private institutions handling that. You go, why? The city, they, they started realizing, man, there's some money in this thing. I mean, the federal government will pay you to get them dental help and get them a, a, a law help and, and make sure that they have medical help and to make sure they have this and that. You have to insure all those people. You know what salaries you have to pay for all that and benefits you have to pay for that for people to babysit the people like that? You don't ever think about that. The average number the last time I looked it up was $75,000 per inmate per year in a county detention facility, and that's been at least 10 years ago. I guarantee you it's over $100,000. What's in that number? Transportation costs, security costs, 24-hour room service. You say it's not 24 hours. Yes, it is. Somebody has to be watching them 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I don't care if they're sitting behind a camera. Somebody has to be manning that camera. You say, what? They have to have certain dietary needs met. You talk about cha-ching, 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 cha-ching. I mean, you got uniforms, you got training, you got in-service training, you got all the things that are required by the federal government so they don't wind up suing your head off and that kind of stuff taken care of. Seventy-five to a hundred thousand dollars per inmate. I mean, a lot of people, you don't even you don't even make that kind of money. <laughs> and they spend that much to take care of a guy that broke the law. Because they're going to correct him. I'm all for it. But the problem is the statistics don't prove it's correcting anybody. You say, why? They've learned all I have to do is just act like I'm sorry. I'll take a plea deal. I go and do my time. And what kind of time is it? Got an education. Got my teeth fixed. Got my medical. Got clothes provided for me. Got three hots and a cot. Television. Had it pretty good. Had it better than I had it on the street got with a bunch of ne'er-do-wells and learned how to do a better job of being a criminal. Birds of a feather. I, I'm, I, I may be speaking to the exception. Some of you may have gone and learned your lesson. Praise the Lord for it. That's a great thing. But you're an exception. You're not the rule. You know I'm telling the truth. I know you don't like it, but it's the truth. It has nothing to do with skin color. It has to do with criminal behavior. You say, why? Your idea of God is, you big old Santa Claus up there, and I ah, don't worry about it. God understands. He's got you. Do you hate evil? Why don't it turn your stomach when downtown you have uh, individuals that are in a gay parade and your mayor is downtown passing out filth? Mm -hmm. Where's your letter? Yep. I won't even go over what they were passing out with kids in there. Yes. In my day, it was, could be considered you contributing to the delinquency of a minor and probably lewd and lascivious assault on a child to hand some of that stuff out. Yep. I'm talking about they put it in the newspaper with the pictures and put it on the news media and the television with the pictures of the stuff. Yep. They wrote about it yes. with children there and the rainbowettes running around there and letting their kids be exposed to it. Do you hate evil? Do you hate it enough to depart from it? Do you ever even say anything about it? Or are you just kind of like, well, I don't want to really cause trouble. You ever watch how many babies get murdered in Jacksonville every year? Do you even pay any attention to it? 
You say murdered, that's a, a woman's uh, uh, a choice of her own body and all that kind of stuff. It ain't her body. She ain't killing herself. Oops, excuse me. Well, that's all changed now. You know, they reversed Roe v. Wade and now it's against the law to be able to have it. A, a, easy now, easy now. You're speaking out of turn. You haven't done your homework very well. But you know what happened right after they wind up uh, drowning out all them babies over in Egypt? God drowned out all the Egyptians. He set them up by having them chase the Israelites out into the Red Sea and he drowned them out. You keep on monkeying around with that and you watch and see how the Lord looks at it. Well, preacher, you know, there's a situation, ethics and all that. I understand unusual circumstances. Can I say this without being a jerk? Probably better than some of you. I understand certain circumstances. I get that. But those are exceptions. Those aren't rules. Now you have a, you don't play, but I mean, don't pay, but play. Hey, I guarantee you this. I guarantee you if you pause long enough to accept the responsibility for what it is that comes along with playing, you might be a little less hur in a hurry to play. Amen. I know, I know I'm in a Baptist church right now and I know what I'm about to say is going to really bug some of y'all. But I'm in Baptist churches enough to know this. You have parents in Baptist churches that are loading their kids up on uh, uh, how can I say it the right way? So was, um, with uh, uh, contraceptives uh, to prevent the results of premarital coming together. Read between the lines. Oh, so I, I get it. You just want to make sure that she doesn't get because you already know she's going to. Do you fear the Lord? Do you hate evil? Enough to depart from it? Well, but preacher, I mean, what happens if she's 14 or 15 and winds up with a... I don't know. What do you reckon they did before you had all your forms of birth control? How do you think they handled all that? How in the world did we ever make it without the internet and the cell phone? Do you fear the Lord? Do you hate evil? See, when that chicken comes and sits on the pinnacle of your roof, it's a little different, isn't it? It's like, well, but you don't understand my circumstance. Okay. Why don't you teach abstinence? Amen. Amen. Instead of complaining about what the public schools teaching or not teaching, they don't teach evolution, they, don't te they teach evolution, not creationism, and they don't teach abstinence, they give, okay, why don't you teach them the opposite side of that? Why don't you tell them what's right? Well, because you don't trust your kids? Or is it because you're looking back in your own history? Come on. Come on. Do you fear the Lord? Why don't you teach them to fear the Lord? Amen. Well, preacher, that just seems like a little bit of act of faith. First Peter, real quick, let me just read this to you, let you go to sleep on this one. Chapter number 1, look in verse number 13. Wherefore, go up the loins of your mind, be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ, talking about the second coming, as obedient children, not a fashioning or yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. And if ye call on the Father, who without respect of person judgeth according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning here in... In what? Fear. Well, that's got to be a misprint. We better change that. That's not a good word. In fear of what? In fear of God. i got to be concerned about what God thinks about what I'm doing, not what the norm is. God knows what is the norm. 
I've heard the new thing coined after COVID, and I've heard it said now time and time and time again to the point that it's become almost a fundamental of faith. It's like, well, this is the new norm. Well, there's a lot of things about the old way that didn't get updated to the new norm. And just because the world has changed, it doesn't mean that the Bible is a new norm. It's still the old paths. It's still the old time way. You want me to help you with sin? I'm going to be the doctor now for just a minute. I'm going to give you a, I'm going to give you a diagnosis. I'm going to tell you the reason that you continue to sin is you don't fear the Lord. I'm going to give you the prognosis. The wages of sin is death. I can give you a prescription. Fear the Lord and you'll stop sinning. And you'll feel guilty as all get out when you do, and that'll keep you in the right line with the Lord.